Hi, everyone. Welcome to Six Figure Authors, the show that helps you take your writing career to the next level. We're sharing our own insights as authors have been publishing uh, basically since the beginning of the, I keep wanting to say the dawn of the e-reader, <laughs> uh, while also interviewing industry experts and other successful authors to help you figure out what's working right now. I'm Andrea Pearson, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Joe Lalo. And I'm Lindsay Baroker. And we already recorded this one. Lindsay, do you want to explain why we recorded this one already? <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, another interview that Joe and I recorded, um, I think it was also June or July, before we kind of figured out that Andrea was going to come on board and help us get this show rolling <laughs> three months later. <laughs> she was like, she was like, hey guys, are you ever going to get that podcast up? And I'm like, I was like, hey, so my episode, that the one that I keep searching for, I can't find anywhere. <laughs> so we are officially live, and um, this interview was with K.M. Shea, who's a fairy tale fantasy author primarily, and she does really well. I think everything she talks about in here is um, still going to be useful. It's only been a couple months since we did the interview. Uh, so hope you uh, enjoy the show. Hop on in. Yeah, it's it's a good one. I enjoyed it. <laughs> We've got fairy tale author K.M. Shea, also known in, on the show as Kitty, uh, who writes uh, fairy tales, mostly exclusive to Amazon, I believe. We'll be asking her about that. And she's been publishing for several years now. We're going to ask her how, you know, we're going to talk about how to keep your book selling year after year and uh, kind of reach a higher level and maintain it because that's always a challenge. And also something she's done really a good job of is just building a loyal fan base and a community of readers who go out and buy all our new books. Welcome to the show, Kitty. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, more than I told them, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me on the show. I love both you guys, so it's really exciting to be here. And I'm so touched that I'm the first guest too. It's like, huh, life goal checked off. Um, but yeah, so I'm Kitty, pen name uh, K.M. Shea, um, and I got started writing books when I was a kid, wrote my first one when I was in eighth grade, kept writing um, up until about 2012, which is when I found out about the Kindle being an actual thing. So in 2013, I decided I was going to give it a go. I ended up writing um, a couple different books, and then in December of 2013, I wrote my first fairy tale. Well, not wrote, released my first fairy tale. The following year, I was able to go full time, and after that, it's just been keeping on, I guess. And um, as for what I write, you're correct. I'm mostly well known for fairy tales, but um, I'd say I do just a ton of stuff under the general umbrella of fantasy. Um, I have a time travel romance, paranormal fantasy, urban fantasy. Um, and I also have under a pen name, a lit RPG series, which is also more of a fantasy. I even have an epic fantasy romance, which is kind of interesting. It's an interesting animal. And, but yeah, so I just usually introduce myself as a, a fairy tale fantasy author. So you may know or not know, Joe is getting ready to launch an urban fantasy series. Do you have any advice for him? I, I actually saw, I think that was the first thing you published. I was kind of surfing back through your catalog. Is that right? And you immediately yeah. said, none of this, the fairy tales from here on out. Well, to be perfectly honest, Amazon used to run this um, Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award. And the book that I first published actually like years ago, before I even really understood what an ebook or Kindle was, Amazon had that contest. And my book ended up going to the quarterfinals, I think, which meant that it automatically got uploaded um, for judging. And so that was actually how I technically had my first ebook on there. I don't really count it though, because I had no idea what an ebook was. Um, but yeah, urban, urban fantasy, like I got that series finished and, and I was done with it for now. I kind of have always wanted to go back because urban fantasy can be hilarious and I love humor, but but that was just my little dabbling in there. So I'm not really the person to ask because um, it was young adult, urban fantasy, paranormal kind of thing. And that, that's an entirely different creature than adult. It does seem to be a niche where it's very popular, but also quite competitive. Um, I know when we, we talked to you first on the sci-fi and fantasy marketing show a couple of years ago, and fairy tales were kind of this little undiscovered gem where you had like 10 books in the top 20 or something at the time, and like three other people were writing legitimate fairy tales. Um, it looks like there's more books in there now, but a lot of them did not really look like fairy tales. Can you talk about maybe the advantage of kind of jumping into a smaller niche like that to start with? 
Um, the big thing is, is you're right. It makes it really easy to place high. And because um, there had been two other fairy tale authors kind of before me that had sort of inspired the idea of writing in that category, but they were both on their way out. Like they were closing out their series. They were done. Um, so it was really just me in that space for a while. And that helped a lot because all of my books rose to the top, which was really nice because um, my, my fairy tales actually kind of straddle the line between fairy tale and epic fantasy. So they're also in epic fantasy categories. So as they rose to the top in the fairy tale category, they would then also get higher. They'd rank higher in epic fantasy. The epic fantasy people would then pick them up. And it was a really nice and useful cycle, I guess you could say. And those seem to be under the fantasy category. I actually have an itch to write like some sci-fi fairy tale retellings. And I was like, where would I put these not military sci-fi? Uh, yeah, there's made your category. Yeah, well, I think you could put them in, in fairy tales because there's a famous, um, I can talk really, traditionally published um, series that was a young adult sci-fi fairy tale retelling. And that series did amazing. It, it was a bestseller. I think the entire series was a New York Times bestseller. So Yeah, Marissa Myers. Yep. I, I read them post. this year on vacation and I, I don't usually like YA, but I kind of got sucked in with the cyborg Cinderella. I was like, yes, that's right up my alley. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really like them too, just because they were very different. Now, um, we'll ask a couple more questions about fairy tales and then for, for those people out there to, you know, write different genres and don't care, <laughs> we'll move into the more uh, generic or for all genre fiction kind of stuff. But for people who are always looking for that niche where it's, it's still not super competitive, as, as I invite our audience to invade your niche, uh, <laughs> don't mind us. Um, could you talk about, you know, do you need to like really hit the tropes or is it just more about being, are there tropes with these or you just have to be kind of faithful to the original fairy tale? Well, to start with, there's really two kind of different takes that you can have on a fairy tale. One is called um, grim dark. That's where things usually tend to be a lot darker, a lot grittier. Um, you see some of those kinds of remakes. Like there's a remake of Hansel and Gretel where they were like monster killers or something. And that is a perfect example of, of grim dark. Um, and then there's uh, usually the other kind is more like clean romance, like bright, happy. Um, I've heard it called noble bright, but I really don't know that it has a specific name. And those are like the two basic camps. And um, the, the happier clean romance one is, tends to take over young adult. Grimdark um, does better in adult. I haven't really seen a Grimdark series do super well in young adult. That's my dog in the background, if you guys hear, I'm sorry. But I haven't seen a Grimdark um, series do really well in young adult in a while. Um, I think that's just kind of how things have shaken out. But um, in addition to that, then you are correct. Um, when you end up doing a fairy tale uh, retelling, you, you'd have to stay, what I would say, like true to the heart of the original, um, particularly the big Disney ones. So Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, those are the ones you have to be extra careful with. Um, when you get farther away into like 12 Dancing Princesses or Puss in Boots, you can be a little more carefree. But then you also, like, they don't tend to do as well as the, the big um, Disney four. But you can still do lots of different stuff. You can still have lots of innovation. Um, it's just a matter of keeping the heart the same. So, for example, we're going to take Beauty and the Beast because that's um, one of the most popular ones. Uh, My Beauty and the Beast opens up with Beauty falling through the roof of the Beast's castle. He's not at all interested in her, so he just dumps her on his servants. And she's stranded there not because he's keeping her captive, but because her leg is broken and she hates him for reasons that we don't know or understand. So that's very different in terms of like how they come together is very different than the traditional Beauty and the Beast story. And um, the Beauty's background is different too. So it works because I still have that, like she's stuck in the castle, they're slowly falling in love um, theme there versus I wouldn't be able to have her bust to the castle uh, roof kill the beast, skin him, and like make him into a rug for her study. Like that, that would not go down well. So you, like I said, you, you want to keep the heart, but you can definitely change things as long as it has echoes of the original. Now, people are like, a while ago, I was invited to be part of a, of a promotion that was a, basically a big cross promo for, for fairy tale stuff. And uh, at first I thought, because I had not looked deeply into it when the first offer was made, that fairy tale, like, we all know the feel of a fairy tale story. You know, like, even when it's not a pre-existing fairy tale, oh, well, there's a, you know, there's a, uh, like, Shrek is a fairy tale movie, 
that is not any one specific fairy tale. Uh, if there's a dragon and a tall tower and a princess in it, that's a fairy tale. But it seems to me like the fairy tale category is really reserved for specifically retelling fairy tales that everybody knows. Like, are, can you put something in the fairy tale category that is not a pre-existing fairy tale? You can, but to be honest, the most marketing power you're going to get is if you do a retelling of a, a more famous fairy tale. Um, I've seen lots of authors do original fairy tales, and uh, they really enjoy them. They do a great job, have great books, but I'm kind of lazy. So I would rather um, have just the name of the fairy tale do a lot of the marketing for me. So that's why I very specifically don't really do original fairy tales, or I kind of do, but like that that's a totally different series, totally different topic. In my Timeless Fairy Tale series, I just follow the originals, so... And uh, I mean, obviously, there are huge numbers of, of fairy tales across assorted, you know, different cultures. But as you said, there's the big ones, the Disney ones, you know, there's the big ones that everyone's heard of. And so how many times can you go back to the well on that? Like when, when you start getting far enough from the Disney ones, do you just sort of, OK, I'm no longer writing fairy tale? Or can you actually like revisit a fairy tale that even you yourself have told? Um, I found there really isn't an end to fairy tales. Just, I have um, 11 fairy tales, technically 12, because I also have a, a little side series that just covers one fairy tale. Um, but yeah, I don't really think I'm going to run out of fairy tale content anytime soon. Um, but you are correct. I have seen people end up doing like a, a traditional epic fantasy retelling of, say, Beauty and the Beast, and then going back and doing a contemporary retelling of the same fairy tale of Beauty and the Beast. Totally different plot, obviously very different feel because it's young adult contemporary. Um, Jenny James, I believe, she's one who did that. She first um, got her name known for doing fairy tales, and now she has a couple uh, contemporary versions. All right. And, and uh, like, do you find that, let's say, uh, we've talked about a lot on, on the previous show uh, about how um, it seems like what you want to do is stand out, but what you really want to do is be a standout version of a thing everybody knows. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm sure there are fairy tales that are downright fascinating that nobody's ever heard of. Is there any, like, is there value in tracking down the really intellectually and intriguing fairy tale that nobody's ever done? Uh, or when you're getting that deep, do you just sort, sort of try to find uh, an untapped layer of, uh, of, somewhat still more popular fairy tales like because i know when i was a little kid i, I watched uh, uh animated versions of fairy tales and there was ones i had only ever seen in that show and they were some of my favorites but i've spoken to people about them for years and none of, nobody knows them so like how how in love with a story can you fall while still be like uh oh, i guess i guess this one's not gonna help me <laughs> um that's where I think you'd kind of have to define, am I doing this because I love the story or am I doing this because I want to uh, make money? And if you really are serious about like uh, making this your, your career kind of move, um, it's wiser to stay to the more mainstream ones. That being said, I have found ways, because I'm the same way, like I love to read up on like all these obscure fairy tales. So um, I have found a way to include them and that is I will bury them within layers of the other stories. So I still get to tell them um, it's just they're they're a much smaller case, so and, and shorter too. So it's a little more condensed. But then I still get to share them, which I always enjoy. I'm now imagining someone doing a box set of like Beauty and the Beast retellings, but each one's different. But it's always Beauty and the Beast, and then it's 99 cents and a thousand pages and Kindle Unlimited. So <laughs> for that <laughs> super fan of Beauty and the Beast, you'd have all the different uh, options. That is, Beauty and the Beast is actually, I think, traditionally the best-selling fairy tale out of them all. Beauty and the Beast followed by Cinderella, typically, I think, is how most authors find in terms of sales. Usually, don't, like, take my word for it. But. Oh, I'll keep that in mind for my sci-fi versions that I'm, <laughs> among a million other things, want to do. So, I imagine you kind of have a similar problem to uh, romance authors in that it's expected to be a complete story in one novel, or... If you break it up, you might get some slack from the readers. How do you make a series? Because I noticed you've got series of fairy tales. Um, and how, yeah, how do you kind of get people to go from one to the next, even if maybe they don't even know the next fairy tale and they wouldn't be interested in it, they, or they don't think they are? Uh -huh. Well, for my series of standalones, I ended up creating this big, like, 
plot that kind of goes across all of the fairy tales and, and it, it starts very slow. So it's a very slow introduction, but I usually kind of um, drag them in with like fight scenes and references to other countries, royalty and um, various political schemes and stuff like that. Because um, even though I write fairy tales, I definitely lean more to the side of, of epic fantasy. Um, so I'm a little low on the romance and a lot higher on fights and like, wizards fighting and stuff like that um so that helped as well because i did pull in a lot more of the epic fantasy crew and they're kind of trained to just keep going um but as i ended up like crafting this this great big plot where everything was building to one point um people then really wanted to read all the books because they wanted to make sure they hadn't missed anything they wanted to try and find all the secret hidden clues and stuff like that and also because i had a lot of crossover where you will see characters from previous novels or in some of them, you might see characters that will end up becoming having stories of their own. And so people become very interested and invested in those additional characters. And they either want to see more of them or, or they're hoping to find out a little more about them. And that helps a lot. Yeah, that seems to be the, the thing in romance, too. If you can introduce the next couple in the previous couple's books. Or uh, when I did a sci-fi romance, I just had like all five women get kidnapped at the beginning, you know. So you just wait, you know, then then they are. They're waiting for like number four story because they like that character it seems like you do you know a less traditional series you still have to figure out a way to kind of make it a series and make people want to keep reading on yeah yeah the series that i wrote is very like political it the way i would describe it is it's kind of like lord of the rings meets fairy tales so you've got like a bunch of different countries and cultures and and then each fairy tale happens in a different country and so it's it's really fascinating too for me as an author to be able to play with how the fairy tales all kind of move together to bring about like these big final battles so that that's more of like the fantasy way of weaving it in um i know like you were saying with the contemporary romance it's more of just making sure that you introduce those other characters so and we kind of talked about how fairy tales is a semi-small niche at least on amazon but it is the kind of thing that can spill out and you know everybody loves their fairy tale retellings and it sounds like you're kind of in the epic fantasy might get that crowd too do you think there's at a point when if you have this goal of becoming a full-time author and making a pretty good income is like are there ever when a niche is too small that you should just pass it by or is that always like something to exploit if there's not a whole lot of people writing that already um that's kind of a tough call i had um well like i mentioned at the beginning of the show i i had a um, historical time travel romance type series for King Arthur. And uh, that series that I wrote always is really easy to place in the King Arthur um, category because it just isn't a super popular category. And uh, so it always ranked really well, um, but it also didn't pull in as much money. Part of that was because they're novellas, so they were 99 cents. So it's hard to make a career off of that. But even then, though, just in terms of sales, it always was outshadowed by my, my Timeless fairy tale series and by other series. So um, it really is tricky in choosing what categories you're gonna write because it's better if you can go with two, like kind of have your book um, hover, I guess you could say over two. So one that is maybe slightly popular, but a little easier to rank in like fairy tales and one that has a bigger audience. Um, the, the catch is you don't wanna make it like too difficult um, or, where you're gonna have two different opposing reader groups. So you want to make it kind of seamless and, and that's where I think it can get tough for people. Yeah, it's definitely uh, kind of a challenge. There's real popular categories if you're a new author it can be really hard to, you know, people are sinking so much money into launches and advertising these days that like, yeah. you know, you can make it, but it, it can be a little easier to mm -hmm. sort of be found if you're in a smaller category and you yeah. can branch out later. And, yeah. Well, and that's a good point, too. It's easier to make loyal fans because I still have a lot of people who found me through that King Arthur series, and they're still with me, still asking for um, additional books in that series, even though I finished it a while ago. So that is a good way to perhaps get like a loyal fan base. I don't know that I would ever say, though, like, yeah, go ahead, launch a 15 book series in there. Like, maybe you'd want to do something shorter just to give yourself momentum. And we've kind of talked about before that you don't necessarily have to write a book a month. There seems to be that myth out there that you have to do this in order to find success. Um, how often do you publish? It looks like you probably do a few a year, but you're not like killing yourself to, to keep them coming out. And they're, they're selling well and you're, you've 
built up this fan base. So <laughs> it seems to be working. Yeah, usually I publish um, a, a slow year for me is five. Usually it's more around six and I've done seven or eight um, per year. But uh, right this year, it's going to be lower though. That's just because the books that I'm writing are way longer. I did not want to make them this long, but they are. And they also take a bunch of research. So to like the authors out there who are sad because you're taking a little bit longer because maybe your books are thicker, uh, don't be disheartened. It's not your fault. I'm there with you. At least uh, with the way things are right now, for those who have decided to do Amazon exclusive and KU, you can get rewarded on the, the backside by those long books with uh, possibly making more from the page reads than you would from the sale of the book at four or five dollars. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sever Bromney is an author who he makes serious bank off of KU. Hats off to him. Because he, he has extremely long books, like you described. So he's yeah. a good example. For anybody who writes long books, check out Sever Bromney. He's a great example. Very nice guy, too. So what are some of the things you did early on to find success? I, I feel like it's great. There's a lot of things you can do to keep fans and to uh, please them after you get them. But, you know, for an author that's just trying to figure out, like, maybe I've written a couple books, but nothing's really taken off yet. Did you have luck early on or did you kind of have to... I don't know, work the system. <laughs> uh, well, I had a couple of books that I already had written before I ended up doing, um, really becoming an author. Cause like I mentioned, I, I wrote books all through high school, college. So I had a couple that were polished enough that I just did another edit and I threw them up and then I ended up writing a couple extras. And I basically just kept trying to find a category that would work for me. Oh, my voice just hitched oddly there. Sorry. But, um, and, and that's how I ended up eventually arriving at the fairy tales. But while I was doing that, um, I was also trying to really build up my community and, and fan base. Um, I had a website and I'd keep that up to date. I would actually blog on it um, about three times a week, uh, which I, I don't do that anymore. That was literally just when I was trying to um, get my readers to come back and, and check in with me frequently. I also ended up starting to write extra content for every new book that I would release. And, um, and so, sometimes it would be multiple chapters. Other times it would just be a short story, including the characters from the book. Um, and I would end up posting them on my site and, and telling people like come to my website to, uh, to read it. That's kind of how I'd lure them in. Um, and that was a great way that I, I managed to really get them more cemented to me as well. Um, and then I also used free days a lot that first year and the second year too, when I, the second year when I was going full time, um, they were super effective back then. I still believe that they're effective now. You just kind of have to use them a little differently, but those were the main things that I had done back in 2013, 2014. Uh, what, what is, what is a difference in the way that you would use uh, free days now versus the way they used to be? Well, um, so for example, now I will end up doing a Facebook live events with uh, other authors. I actually did one with Lindsay. I think that was back in December, I want to say. And then I did another one with um, a bunch of other author friends like uh, Elise Canova. Uh, heh, sorry, Elise. Elise Kova and uh, Annette Marie. I ended up doing one with them. And whenever I do any kind of event with other authors, I always try to give away at least one free book. Um, because it really lowers the barrier of entry. So those readers will then be like, okay, this is a free book. You know, I'm not going to say no to that kind of thing. And, and I try to like spin it as this is a party favor because we always do giveaways at these Facebook live events. And I'm the kind of person I never win, never. So this was originally my, like, I want everybody to win because I never do. So I hear you guys. So, um, but that ended up kind of evolving into it ended up being a great, great way to cross pollinate readers because then I was guaranteed to get new readers because they had the book. All they had to do was check it out. And if I had a halfway decent cover and description, they usually I'd get a certain number of it that would, would give it a try. But um, even beyond that then though, is you can use that to end up showing up in other people's also bots. So after I did that, um, I actually showed up in Lindsay's also bots and Lindsay is now in mine. Like we're, I think like three or four pages deep in our also bots, but we are there. And, and the same thing happened too with uh, the other authors that I have done this with. So that's one of the main methods you can use it for. I also use it as, um, I hesitate to say rewards, really more like thank yous to my reader, readers. Um, so for instance, every Valentine's Day, 
I go specifically to my newsletter, nowhere else, just the newsletter. This is something that they only get. And I will give them a choice of like five or six different books and they will vote on it and they get to decide what book I offer for free on Valentine's Day. And um, everybody gets really excited about that. And and that's another way to engage the community. And then when I end up posting it, I'll, I'll announce like, this is the book the newsletter chose, the newsletter people chose guys, like share it around if you want to. And, and, um, and that works really well. And then I also end up doing a lot of events with my readers and, and I'll put free books out then as well. And um, I also do uh, still do book bubs, which it's nice that I have a variety of series, not just the fairy tales, because I found that I can hit up various book bub lists. So book bub still works really well for me because um, I'll hit up young adult and then the time travel of romance and then uh, fantasy and each one brings in a different group of people. So, and I don't repeat that often. So like, I don't try to do more than one young adult book bub per year, just because I don't want to oversaturate. It's nice to have to choose not to do that, by the way, because we've got, I'm sure we've got a lot of listeners who would be thrilled to have the opportunity to oversaturate book, book bub just from not having been able to, to get any of them selected. Uh, one other thing I want to say, you talk a lot about um, uh, engaging audience. Like we are, if you're a writer, you're, you're familiar with at least creating content because your books are content. But how important is it for your content to actually sort of produce a conversation? Like what is that? How, how does that help with your audience? Now, do you mean like my books or do you mean like my social media? Social like media, stuff? Like, like when you're, when you're interacting directly with your, with your audience. So a lot of it will end up kind of circling my books. So um, the website is the main hub. And um, so for instance, on there, whenever I do a new book launch, I will have anywhere from three to five blog posts all about the new book, whether it's inspiration or like taking a look at um, like the characters or just secret behind the scenes kind of information. Um, but then if, if we're talking about like away from book launches where I don't have like any kind of event going on or something on Facebook, I, I try to do a variety of like funny reading comics or memes, um, asking questions about stuff, whether it's like, what would your dream library be? Or what is your favorite historical fiction book this year kind of thing? And then I um, also give them updates on me, um, pictures of my dog. Uh, I ended up reading somewhere, like this is a pretty common entrepreneur practice where it's like, I think it's you're supposed to have like a positive non-salesy interaction with your customer. I want to say it's like seven or 10 times somewhere in that neighborhood. I, I don't know the exact number, but, and then for every seven to 10 times, you can ask one time, like you can sell them something. So that, that's something that I kind of took to heart. Um, and when I first got started, they didn't talk a lot, but uh, for instance, I, I did end up just recently asking my readers, like, what would your favorite, what is your dream library? And within like 24 hours, I ended up getting like 30 or 40 comments and like over a hundred um, reactions kind of thing. So it pays off. You just have to keep at it. And, and I think being genuine is really important. So like if you come across as being like, fake or just doing it because you want them to like you and buy your stuff, they're going to know and they aren't going to stick around then. I often feel that I have to write all these short stories to go with the series. So I'll have something to give them when I email them and be like, book four is out, go buy it. Oh, oh here's a free short story. And I did a character <laughs> interview on my blog. And I don't know if that is true or not, but I, I, I agree with you. I really want to like give them a really good value for being a newsletter subscriber or following mm -hmm. on Facebook. And um, it can't hurt. You can always repurpose those stories and things later. And, uh, you know, I've had stuff that, I got paid for later for an anthology that originally just went out to the newsletter subscribers. So it's, I don't think it's a bad policy to give away lots of cool stuff. And it can, I actually just did one that, you know, prompted somebody to go buy the first three books in the new series because I sent out, here's a free background story about the characters. And they were like, Oh, I like it. So of course I'll check this out. So I think that's a good, <laughs> a good strategy. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree giving away like extra chapters and extra content is definitely a, a great way to sell readers on, on new books and, and series and to keep them coming back too, which is a concern as well. So it sounds like, are you using Facebook, like a Facebook page or a Facebook group for asking like the, the library dream library and stuff like that? Or is that a newsletter? 
Um, I just have a Facebook page and then I do have a newsletter. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I have a giant arse website. That's, that's the big hub. Um, I do also have a Pinterest page and a kind of defunct Twitter, Twitter page. We don't really use it that often except just to tweet things out. And, um, I do also have an Instagram page that I'm not super great at updating. And then I have a discord channel, which is super fun. Is that a, that's kind of a chat room, right? Is that just something you invite your readers to so they can stalk you more efficiently? <laughs> you knew stalking was going to come into the show sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it is basically a chat channel, but you can download like the app on your phone or on your computer so you can access it however you like. And it was actually something my readers have been asking for for a while, but I was kind of like, guys, I'm not that cool. You really don't want to talk to me, but they insisted. So I ended up making this card channel and I drop in every once in a while, but it's actually really cool because we have lots of various channels. We have specific ones for some of my series, but then we also have um, like a movie and TV shows one, which of course we were all um, fangirling over like uh, Avengers Endgame in there. And then we have another one on books, which is where I basically go to beg them to read a series that I read and I really like and I want them to read so I can talk to someone about it. Um, so we have all kinds of other great stuff. And um, for the instance, this last month, I haven't even really been able to go there very much because I'm slaving over my um, current book that's pretty difficult to write, but uh, they're just continuing to chat by themselves and, and just keep going and talking. And they really are becoming a genuine community, even when I'm not there to be the glue that makes them stick together. They've bonded. Yeah, I've, I've uh, Discord is becoming incredibly popular across an awful lot of different things. Uh, I have a Patreon, and you can, if you if you run a Patreon, you can actually just uh, assign a Discord role. Basically, you can just put it automatically into Patreon where you're invited to the Discord. So uh, it's it's amazing the sort of use that uh, that people have for Discord. Uh, when you in your Discord, do you find that like when you have a, a question about say what you're writing? Do you ever go to your readers and be sort of floating ideas, sort of subtly, like, which is better between these choices that I'm mulling over? I tend not to just because everybody else would get really mad at me. So the Facebook page would get mad. The website blog reading people would get mad. The newsletter people would get mad. So that's the one thing I do have to kind of be careful about is that I don't ask any one group something like too specific because otherwise the rest of the groups will get um, extremely sad, which is true. Like, I mean, I've worked really hard to talk to all of them. So I try not to do anything like too exclusive in terms of like asking them about something about my writing, but I will ask them, um, just stuff about, uh, like for instance, when there's a book that I want them all to read, or, um, there's been a time or two where I've asked them if they caught like certain hints and series and stuff like that. So, and, um, I forgot to answer this too, as part of Lindsay's previous question. The Discord channel is open to everyone. Um, it's available. It's linked to my website. So we have it um, up there. Excellent. Uh, so we, earlier, we talked about uh, mailing lists. I'd like to ask you a question about this, because uh, mailing lists obviously are very important. It tends to be a key part of any, any uh, author's thing. But gr how to grow your mailing list is something that a lot of people stumble over. So do you actively grow your mailing list, or is it organic? Um, I actively try to grow it, but I really also try to limit it. I am not interested in having a huge mailing list. I'd rather have a group of really loyal, really active people. So I have a really, um, unusually high click through and, and read rate just because these are people that have very slowly kind of joined, uh, the ranks and joined up. Um, so I actually like, I'll be honest, my, my newsletter is only like 4,000 people, but everybody is so active that you have 4,000 active people and they can move some books. So um, it's really cool. But I, I do try to uh, recruit. I do that by having what I call like a KMJ starter pack. So it has um, at the end of every book that I write, there's a link where it basically will tell you, you know, like if you want to learn more, sign up for my newsletter, you'll get the KMJ starter pack for free. It is um, available through Book Funnels. So they get a legit ebook, and uh, it has a little sample of pretty much every major series that I've written, um, just so they can kind of get a feel for what those series are like. And then there's like a, a complete, um, tiny fairy tale retelling in there too, uh, and that usually cements, I guess you could say, the relationship. And then I also have a, um, oh, what's it called? It's that line of emails you have um, when somebody subscribes. 
Uh, autoresponder. Autoresponder. There you are. Yes. Yes. I have an autoresponder with, um, it's got stuff like on my books, but it also has like pictures of me and my dog. And I kind of talk about like my sort of weird sense of humor. And, and I also try to offer um, benefits too. Like I mentioned, the uh, poll for Valentine's Day where they get to vote what they want. And it's also an easier way to keep in contact with me than constantly having to come back and check the website. I do get people who come and check the website every day. Uh, but the, the newsletter people find it a little easier because I deliver basically all the content that the website has in one neat, easy uh, newsletter so they can just click to whatever interests them. Now, you say that you have a really high click-through rate, and particularly when you start, when you, when you have giveaways, like you talk about, you, you know, you provide a giveaway to people who sign up as opposed to, uh, you know, using it as bait uh, to get somebody in. Uh, do you ever go through and prune your, your, uh, your mailing list to get rid of people who seem to be inactive, or you sort of trust that the people who have joined are, are going to be active? We pruned for the first time ever this past summer. I say we, meaning me and my assistants. If I ever say we, it's the royal we. It means the assistants and I. But, uh, but yeah, we pruned for the first time. It was not as many as you think. I think it was just a couple hundred. Um, I want to say like one or 200, maybe 300 tops. Um, but yeah, so we, that was the first time we did it. And it was just once every five years. I don't think that's too bad. You mentioned assistants. Uh, you and yourself and I. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, you know, I know a lot of authors jump to that early on and other ones are like, no, I'm going to do it all myself. At what point did you decide, uh, you know, I'm making enough money. It would really help if I could bring someone on. And what do you have them do for you? Um, so my assistants know me in real life. That should be something I, I add. I, I trust them. They're great friends of mine. And, uh, they decided it was necessary for me to get some help because I was like a crying, constantly sick mess because I was just so stressed out and I couldn't do everything and I was overwhelmed. And um, because they're my friends, they care for me. They they kind of started to to step in and help me. And and so I've got two. I've got Merlin and then um my what I refer to as my rock star assistant Meg. Uh, Merlin used to do my covers. She's kind of stepped back from that now and, and we try to hire that out but she does these amazing graphics um whether it's for promos so like the facebook live events not facebook live events just facebook events in general or um she does graphics for my blog entries um i'll do like book lists so she'll make graphics for that um she also does these amazing quote images where she goes through and looks at my book's top highlighted lines and then she will um, put them on these beautiful images that kind of relate to the quote. And then she puts those on Pinterest, but we also use those for blog posts and for Facebook. And I've used them a couple of times for Instagram too. And, and everybody really loves those. Um, they are great conversational pieces for social media. That's your tip of the day. Um, but uh, so she mostly stays in the graphic stuff. She also is responsible for what little advertising I do do. I only usually do um, I say I, but it's all Merlin. Um, we usually do less than 200 a month, um, just because we don't really see it doing a lot. Um, we more use it on like, if I have a book, um, that's on temporary 99 cent sales, then we'll, we'll try and double down on it for a little bit. But so she is responsible for creating ad copy and all that kind of stuff. She also writes all my book descriptions because I'm not very good at that. It takes me forever. Um, but yeah, so she does more of the advertising graphical stuff. And then over on the other side, Meg um, is a numbers wizard. So she constantly tracks all my numbers. We have a weekly record of all my stuff, which helps a lot in checking to see if advertising is working. Um, she'll very specifically be able to look at my numbers and say, okay, you did this first book on special when you were releasing your 10th book. You sold this many more copies of the first book because it was on sale for 99 cents. And she could literally like look at that and tell based on previous books, sales patterns and stuff like that. So that is absolutely invaluable because I am as dumb as a stump when it comes to numbers. I could never do that. And, and she works with Merlin too, to make sure that like the marketing stuff um, ends up going through. She helps me make sure that my book bub ads are absolutely paying off and stuff like that. She also does all the repetitive things that I hate. Like, um, Formatting. She does all my formatting for eBooks, paperbacks. Uh, she also does all the back matter for those. Um, about once a year, we will end up updating the back matter. 
she does all that, which bless her heart. Um, she also does error tracking for me. So if I have a reader that sends in an error, she organizes it in this little spreadsheet because she's the numbers genius. And then once she feels like she has enough, she'll send them to me. I'll go over them, approve them. She will then, this is, I love this part. She will go and change the word file, change the vellum file for the ebook, change the word file, change the vellum file for the paperback. And if it's in a uh, box set, she will change the word file and the vellum file, for the box set. And then she will upload them all to Amazon after going over and making sure that they formatted correctly. I love that because I had to waste so many hours doing that before she ended up helping me. And then she also is really good with my readers. So she actually um, does a lot of my emails now because we get lots of, of questions that are um, kind of similar, asking like the same thing, like when is the next book gonna be out? Or is this specific character ever gonna get a story of their own? And she's really great in answering uh, the emails as well. So it's actually quite funny. She's kind of becoming a little mini celebrity among my readers as well because of that. I think I need to have Merlin. Is that is that the one that was doing all those things? Yeah, Merlin was the one who does like all the advertising and, and ad copy and stuff like that. And then uh, Meg is the one that does like all the, the repetitious formatting and, and stuff like that. Ooh. Yeah, that's the stuff I put on a list and I have an admin day <laughs> someday in the future. Um, but it sounds like you knew these people in real life. Uh, do you have any suggestions? I don't know if you've seen, I know that sometimes you'll see personal assistants or author assistants. Um, but you know, they, they do it for like a number of authors because most authors may only need like five or 10 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I guess you probably haven't had to look for that, but do you have any suggestions for people if they're kind of getting into that stage where it's like, Oh, I'm getting a lot of email and, my answer to the repetitive questions has been to do a blog post about it and then I can refer them like, why are your books not in KU? Well, I wrote about this here you go. But, you know, the <laughs> next step would just be to have somebody answer those kind of things for you. Mm -hmm. um, I would say try to think outside a box. So it might be a good idea, depending on what you're very specifically looking for, it might be a good idea to hire an assistant that is already in the industry. Otherwise, um, neither Merlin or Meg are at all like involved in the publishing industry. They both have really brainiac backgrounds. Meg is an industrial engineer, and uh, that's partially why she can do all this number stuff that I was talking about. And she, um, she's so awesome. She does time studies on herself so she can like try to beat her record in terms of like formatting and stuff like that. So that's what I mean by like trying to think outside the box. If you have brainiac friends or relatives, they might actually be your best bet because they're also trustworthy. Meg has the mini Mac that I bought for the business. And so it's a really good thing that I know her because it's at her house. Um, so as I was saying, try to think outside the box. Otherwise, if there's like very specific social media stuff that you're looking for help for, in that case, it might be better to go with someone who's um, a little more tried and true and that other authors have used. Um, but the, the mid admin stuff that I was kind of talking about, I think it, it would probably be more important to have someone who you know you can trust and who you know will show up because a lot of the stuff is easy to teach or it's teachable. It might take them a little while, it might be a little bit of learning curve, but um, the trust in that case is most important because Meg has all of my information from Amazon. So obviously I trust her a lot. Yeah, that's always a little nervous thing. That's the problem with Amazon advertising is like, that's something I wouldn't mind outsourcing, but it's all tied into the same account and password that everything is on. And you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to hand that off to some random advertising expert. Um, <laughs> I will say that even though I don't have like a dedicated personal assistant, I've kind of done like some of the stuff you've been talking about. Like I have uh, my beta readers are, you know, I'm they become good friends and they'll like proof the audio books for me. I'm like, here's $20, $20 an hour. I don't want to do this. You want, anybody want to do this? And they're like, yes, like, excellent. And then you can, you know, kind of trust that you're giving the money to somebody who's going to come through for you. So mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. definitely worthwhile. And that's a great example too, of something that you should outsource all the putsy stuff that takes a lot of time. That's what you want to get rid of. So like for me, it was the formatting and, and the number stuff. I had to get rid of that because that was a real, uh, wall in terms of trying to write books. That stuff would just eat up my time because I wasn't really good at it. I, I didn't have like the right mental organizational workflow. But like, so my numbers recording used to take me like two hours. Um, I think Meg does it in like 10 minutes. So 
It just goes to show that the right person for the job will, will really help you. You mentioned that you kind of got, was it you turned full time around 2014? So five, six years now, you've been doing pretty good. What are some changes that you've kind of seen? I mean, there's been a ton of changes. Amazon ads became a thing. Canal Unlimited became a thing. The other sites have also have had some changes coming along. Is there any adapting that you've had to do, like stuff that's really different for you now than it was kind of when you first saw some success? Not really. Um, the one thing is I've, I've kind of changed, and we talked about this a little earlier, how I use free days for Kindle books now because it, it doesn't work quite the same way it used to. And um, pre-orders is now something I'm, I'm kind of playing around with a little more. Previously, I was very strict in that I would only have a pre-order for about like seven to 10 days because I really wanted to make sure I had the final version in there. So that was really all I was willing to wait for. So that's something I'm playing around with. And um, rapid releasing is a strategy that I would really like to get into. But um, part about building a community base is that like they're going to be there for me. So that's why even though like advertising like Facebook has changed on uh, let me restart that. So Facebook advertising has come and, and I don't want to say gone, but it's not quite the gold mine that it used to be. And, and AMS ads are kind of doing the same thing. But um, having my dedicated readers is kind of like having someone having my back. My readers have my back. So that stabilizes me a lot where I think people normally don't have that. There are other ways to do it. Like um, uh, you, Lindsay, actually, I think are a great example because you so consistently put out books. Uh, I think people just know to come back to you and Amazon will market the heck out of your stuff because we read, we meaning we are fans, read so much of your stuff that it, we just automatically then get marketed to. And I think uh, this is this might just be me supposing a little bit, but I, um, since I've also done stuff with Joe, I feel like Joe is also a little more like me in that having those faithful readers will kind of balance out some of the rapid and, and big changes in the industry. So it all kind of boils down to what you decide your marketing plan is going to be. It is definitely comforting to get to the point where you have this loyal fan base and they're going to try anything new you read because you've like developed, you have the style, you know, something about what you write, whether it's the quirky characters or the dialogue, and no matter what you try, that's always going to be a part of it. And they know that and they'll follow you along. And then you kind of know that like anytime you launch something new, it's not going to flop. You're, you're going to cover your costs and, and probably do fine. And with me, I, I listen to all the podcasts on the marketing, of course. And that's why we want to have interviews and guests to, to ask the questions that I listened. And I'm like, why didn't you ask that question? <laughs> um, but I always try everything new with a new launch. I'm like, okay, MS ads, Facebook ads. But you, we were talking before the show and you mentioned, you know, you spend maybe a couple hundred dollars a month, it sounds like, on that stuff. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on like, you know, if you can build that fan base, is that as important or do you, does everybody have to learn that stuff right now? I think it more depends on like your personality type. So um, for me, I, I grew up as a, the YouTube generation, like YouTubers really became a thing when I was in college. And so I kind of watched that um, happening and, and also like same with the, the pop star fandoms. So for me, it was always more of like, I, I kind of knew how these communities looked because I belonged to a bunch of them. And uh, because when I got started, I was super poor. So I didn't have any money to do anything, but I did have a little extra time. And, and that's where trying to build that community ended up um, being where I, I sunk all my marketing time in because it, it ended up paying off. And so that's why now that, that is a little more of a long haul game because it took me about six months before I saw any kind of traction before I got like anybody really coming to my website. And then it wasn't until a year later where my readers really started being like, wait, she legit wants to like talk to us about Christmas and stuff and, and like bad Valentine's day poems. I guess we can talk to her. So, um, so that was part of it. I think I kind of lost track of your question. I'm sorry. Do people need to know ads right oh. now? <laughs> yeah. So like, um, so since that's my specific marketing strategy, uh, no, I'm not going to sink a lot of time into advertising. Um, if you, if you're more comfortable writing ad copy, if the idea of doing like these number spreadsheets really just floats your boat, then yeah, I totally think you should do that because that's something that better suits your personality. 
there are all kinds of different like core marketing strategies you can use. What you need to do is find one that best fits you. Um, that will also be a good suit. I guess you could say a good match for your uh, books for your series. There is a book that um, Monica Leonel wrote. I'm afraid I don't remember the title of it, but she literally goes over like, I think it's over 20 different marketing plans. And, and she just kind of like introduces you to them, talks about what works well with them. For some of them, she mentions what doesn't work well. And um, for anybody who's kind of trying to figure out how to do something um, outside of advertising or whatever, I highly recommend you pick up that book because it will really help you define that core marketing strategy that you need to have. Because that's the thing. Once you have like a core strategy, you need to make all of your decisions based off of that. That's why to me, advertising is something Merlin just kind of does on the side. It's never going to be a core part because I already have this giant community. But that's why then I do lots of different stuff with my community because they're the core marketing part for me, for my career. Now, uh, earlier you were talking about that you, you don't watch your numbers, but your numbers are watched. Uh, and uh, so one thing I wonder about, and if you talk to anybody who's in, been in the uh, publishing industry for long enough, they'll talk about how, well, there are ups and downs. Uh, so when, you're, when, when the numbers are being analyzed, like how proactive or reactive are you to changes in the numbers? Like if you see that the sales are starting to sag, are you going to change your plan for the year based upon that? Not usually, but um, both Merlin and Beg are big on planning. Um, I'm much more of a like, hey, what's going on? But, uh, but they're much more like, we're going to be good entrepreneurs and plan ahead of time. So um, to a certain extent, we kind of end up looking at what we're going to do for the year. And then we try to make plans based around that. Um, so for example, right now I am having a dickens of a time writing a really long book, um, which normally my books are, are on the shorter side. They're more between like 60,000 and 80,000 words. This one is currently at 100,000 and it's still going up. Probably is going to be like 140,000. But I knew that going into the series that it was going to be a, a hard time. So we are very specifically doing... Um, a reader event with my readers this summer. We call it the summer read along and that keeps them connected with me. Um, I know it sounds kind of weird because it doesn't really necessarily bolster sales, but part of it is that we do uh, do promos. So right now I have um, a, my first fairy tale three pack on sale for 99 cents. We announced that lots of people buy that. And then we also managed to snag a um, international fantasy book bub for that as well. So that's why we have that. So we'll have it on sale for at least two weeks. Uh, and then that will also prop everything up. Um, and then honestly, being in Kindle Unlimited really also kind of helps with those highs and lows. Uh, because if you can prop those page reads up, that will that will help you a lot to keep the valleys out. And there also comes a certain extent where I have 36 books and like a bunch of box sets. I don't even know how many books I have anymore. And like Lindsay has even more. Joe, I think you have just as many as I have. There comes a, a point when, when you have that many, like it, everything just kind of stabilizes because you have so many just building on top of each other. It's the whole um, Michael Landerlay 20 books to, to 50K kind of idea. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's sort of a landmark in an indie author's career when it's like, oh, how many books do you have? Uh, over 20. Uh, I don't know. Once you get into the dozens, you stop counting. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Yeah. I had somebody ask me once and I was felt like an idiot because I'm like sitting there counting them on my fingers. And I'm like, I'm beginning some. I know I am. And it's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a real good writer. I don't even remember all the books that I wrote. <laughs> I do the same thing. Or like when you go, you're like, do I count the collections? And then there's the couple of novellas. Do those really count? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, one other thing I want to say is uh, you talk about, you know, you, you obviously interact with your audience a lot. Um, do you, when you, when you're talking to your audience, do you sort of try to talk up the next book that's coming out or, or is it just sort of a general interaction? Because I know a lot of people, uh, you know, they sort of build a marketing plan around like, well, I, I just picked out the, the, the cover and uh, now I'm just going into final revisions and here's this coming and all that. So is it conversational or is it structured conversation? Um, so the important thing is to remember that I've been working on my community for five years. So when I first got started, yeah, I would kind of try to be a little more structural in that like I, I would take questions like if I was doing a Facebook Live event. Um, 
And I, w- I would try to kind of like get promos and like get everybody excited for the next book. Now I hide and I hope they don't ask me about it because they're like pounding down the doors because they really want to know. So I, I try to actually avoid doing Facebook live sessions before I have books coming out because I know they know they can lean on me and then I'll end up squealing out spoilers and it's just bad. So so how I interact with them has changed a lot. Now it's gotten to the point where they're just so excited and they psych each other up too. That's a big part of it is that they don't just talk with me. Now they, they interact as a community so they can get each other hyped up. Um, but so now I do things like this past Christmas, I made a gingerbread castle on Facebook Live and I had a couple of my readers are actually professional bakers. So I was learning on Facebook Live how to deal with fondant and that was what we did. Like that, that sounds kind of weird. I mean, we did talk about my books and stuff like that, but for the most part, everybody was giving me decorating advice on, on my castle. So like once you really have this community deeply established, and like I said, the thing to remember is I've been doing this five years. So that's a lot of effort I've put into them. Uh, and that's a lot of time that they've given me. Like once you get to that point, it, it is a different kind of relationship and you really don't have to work so hard at selling to them because they want to support you and, and they love your series. That's why they're there. A gingerbread castle seems like a perfect tie-in for somebody who's writing fairy tale stories. I'm, I'm not sure what you would do if you were writing military sci-fi or uh, thrillers. It was actually a, a Mario castle from Mario the video game. So yeah, It's great if you can kind of geek out with the, those other people that you know, not only do they like your books, but they like all the books that you like in your genre by other authors. And, you know, you kind of have that common element. Hopefully you're all fangirls or, or fanboys together. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that's very true. So we've been talking almost an hour. I just wanted to ask a couple more questions. You are, it sounds like, all in with Kindle Unlimited. Have you tinkered with Wyatt at all? Or are you comfortable? You know, I know a lot of people get nervous about relying completely on Amazon or just worry about supporting only one bookstore, but it, I know it's hard too when they're paying you really well to, <laughs> to just yeah, walk away from right now. We've talked about how it's an advantage to be in KU. What are your mm-hmm. thoughts on all that? Uh, well, so the thing to remember is that I don't like repetitious tasks. So when I first got started, I actually was wide, but I sold like a whopping two copies, I think on like Smashwords or something like that. So I knew I was getting the vast majority of my sales from Amazon. And since I hate repetitious tasks, it was kind of like, why don't I just not upload stuff to all these other sites and save myself like a day? Because that's how long it would take me since I'm not super skilled at that kind of thing. And so I just kind of naturally became Kindle exclusive because it was it was the 80-20 rule. I'm a big believer in the 80-20 rule where you do, I think, it, is it like 20% of the effort for effort for like an 80% outcome? I don't remember the exact thing, but, but that was what made me decide to do that. And then um, part of it is, yeah, the money is amazing. And then I also kind of just made a promise, I guess you could say, in the fact that I have these massive fairy tale series. Um, so I, I have one that's 11 books long. And then I, um, in that 11 book long series, there's one character that appears in every single book. And that's currently the series that I'm writing right now is her series. So there's no way I'm going to pull the timeless fairy tales out from KU um, or this character's series while the series is still being released. And um, I want to make sure I, I really ride that wave. So even after the series ends, it'll probably be a year or two. Um, I would like to move wide eventually, but um, like I said, I really feel like I have to reach that that promise that I, I gave to my readers. I don't want to abandon them. And uh, to answer your question, it doesn't actually really make me nervous, um, but that's because again, looping back to the community, they all know where to find me. If something happens and like Amazon collapses overnight or, or whatever, all of them know where to find me um, because they have like, you know, the extra chapters and they've come to do giveaways and, and promos and all that kind of stuff. So they'll come find me. We'll find a new spot to go. And even if I wouldn't get like the same number of sales that I would on Amazon with KU, they would at least give me that extra boost that I would get in order to launch high initially. So I could, I feel like relatively easily build up my career again, but that's part of the reason why I really push trying to get my readers to come back to my website is so they know where I am and, and we have that kind of relationship where they will come in and check on me. 
Yeah, good point. If you have people at least on your, your newsletter or what, your Discord <laughs> channel, whatever it is, you can always say like, hey, Amazon kicked me out for some reason, you know, hopefully that won't happen. But every now and then you hear stories of people mm -hmm. that have run, the, run afoul of the system. So it, it can make you a little nervous, but um, it sounds like you've got a good thing going there. And I guess that's about all we we're going to ask you. It's been about an hour. Did you have anything else that you know, any advice out there maybe for newer authors that are just kind of trying to get to that next level themselves? Uh, for newer authors, I'd kind of repeat something I'd said earlier, and, and that would be to choose a core marketing strategy and just kind of stick with it and realize that it takes time to develop your core marketing strategy. So you can't try, like, you can't try building a community like I have in like three months or even six months and go, man, I don't have like the kind of interaction that kitty does this obviously isn't going to work and then and trash it or um similarly you can't attempt to do like one of the other many different and equally valid marketing uh strategies and, and just try it for like a month you're never really going to be able to get anywhere if you try something for only a short amount of time and as i said like all the different kinds of marketing strategies are equally as valid this is one that i'm extremely comfortable with because i grew up as a child of social media and youtube and all that kind of stuff so I just sort of knew how to do it, but, um, but lots of people who are more mathematically inclined might be more drawn to advertising. Um, if you're really good at writing fast, like uh, Lindsay, uh, you might just want to end up releasing more books and just being really consistent. And, and that would be your, your marketing promise is that you will release like books that have that specific tone and you'll do it fast and frequently. Um, so yeah, that would be my big thing is, figure out your marketing plan and stick to it and uh, give it time. Yeah. And do you link to the, the places you want them to go in the back of the book, I assume. So it's because people will forget to do that. They're like, nobody goes to my Facebook page. Well, did you announce your Facebook page anywhere? Like in the book that they were reading it. So yeah. Yeah. I literally have in the back of the book where it's like, Oh, go to my Facebook page, blah, 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 blah. But as soon as you get like, it's like, and then they live happily ever after the end. Visit KM Shea for free extra chapters and blah, blah, Like I just hit them straight off. And then the next thing is um, like a little infographic for my newsletter. And then I also mention um, my Facebook page after that. But yeah, I do do that. Yeah. And uh, I feel like that's the time. As a reader, that's when I care most. I'm like, yes. oh, yeah, bonus stuff. Of course, that I'm is check absolutely that out. the time to do it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's when they're like on the high, especially because they're coming off the high of like having that, that great ending. The other thing, too, I would recommend you to is make sure you link up your book to your author profile. So go to Author Central, and as soon as you get that puppy out, go ahead and, and link it up. I've seen so many authors who don't do that. And then your reader literally cannot find that book because if they, do a search for your name, it might show up, it might not. And, and if they go to your Amazon author page, it won't show up unless you specifically linked it up. And you could really botch a release by not doing that. Like if you make it hard for your readers to find it, um, that would be the second piece of advice I would have is always make everything super easy for your readers to find. It is not their responsibility to play detective. It is your responsibility to make it as easy as possible. Like that's also like another basic marketing principle that you'll see from everywhere from like department stores to like all the various like food vendors and stuff. You just want to make it as easy for them to purchase stuff as possible. So try to do all the, the busy work. So that way you have a much more seamless, easy um, click through for them to go. And that will also help a lot. Right. Uh, Author Central on Amazon or authorcentral.amazon.com for I assume most folks have heard of it, but if you have not, because some people won't even fill that out. And then uh, if they click your name on your book page, it just goes to the search results on Amazon and it should go to your author page that lists all of your books. So just good tip there for, uh, <laughs> for those to check into that. And yeah, you can claim your book like pretty much as soon as it has an ASIN. You can, maybe you get an error the first time and then I'll say check again and then it finds it and I add it. <laughs> uh, yeah. And you can do it on a pre-order too. So mm -hmm no excuses you should do that like immediately and i'll try to find for the show notes monica leonel do you think that was prosperous creation make art and make money at the same time i don't think so it was very like i can look it up for you guys um but it was very specifically on like marketing strategies i think it might have been like sell your book or something like that all right well <laughs> we'll get that after the show and i will include it in the show notes so people can check it out it sounded like uh good advice and 
especially right now, there's so much like you have to do AMS ads and here's a course and you have to do Facebook ads and here's a course for that too. Oh, and there's a book pub ads. And I feel like I can see newer authors getting so stressed out because you're just throwing money away left and right. And I know when I got started, like $200 was like a really big deal to pay someone to edit my book. So uh, I now pay much more for editing and they do a much better job. But uh, when you're starting out, you might not have hundreds and thousands to throw at that stuff. So yeah, it's encouraging to know that there are things you can do besides that still. Mm -hmm. All right. Where can people find you online and what's your newest series that maybe they can check out? Super easy. You can find me at kmshay.com. I've got tons of links going everywhere from there. And my newest series is actually called Fairy Tale Enchantress. The first book is Apprentice of Magic. And it's uh it is another one of like the fairy tale meets epic fantasy kind of thing only in this case you're following the fairy tale enchantress who um does all the stuff and all the typical fairy tales so she's extremely tired all the time she needs caffeine <laughs> yeah yeah good nap mm -hmm. all right thank you and joe or, did you have anything you wanted to say in closing I feel like I talk so much more than Joe, uh, poor guy. I, I will just add, uh, talking about Author Central, uh, how important it is. I have got translations, and there are different Author Centrals for different, uh, you know, Amazon storefronts. And I am reminded every time I have a translation come out by my uh, by my translator, go and link it on on you know authorcentral.de because uh, yeah, it is extremely crucial. So. I, 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 I third that recommendation. All right. Excellent. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll be back next week. I think we're going to talk about productivity next week and uh, how to get to like 10,000 words a day. <laughs> Ooh, exciting. Can't wait to hear it. All, All right. right. Cool. So long, everybody. Okay.